they're lost, if they're stuck, or if they're longing for something different in their life. Man of Mastery podcast episode three. Mike Herzog of Life Design Center visits to talk about crucible events and the incredible growth opportunities we find in life's literal and figurative wilderness. Hey guys, just a couple more quick notes before we do jump in. Uh, One is I'm trying something a little different here with this episode. There's so much depth to it. Mike and I are going to break the conversation into two parts, two episodes. Second, we ran into a few issues here and there with the recording today. We're still getting all this dialed in. I would just ask you to work through it, bear with it. Uh, It's going to be well worth it. So with that, let's get into it. All right, Mike, uh, thanks for being here. Mike Herzog of Samaritus Life Design Center. Hey, Mike, uh, thanks for having me. I um, Congratulations on the podcast. I'm excited for you. I'm honored to be part of the initial stages. I'm looking forward to what you've got going on here. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. Why don't we dive right into what you're doing at Life Design Center and the importance of growth through trials and crucibles in life something you call wilderness experiences. Yeah, I can introduce the idea of a wilderness experience. I heard the phrase the first time in the context of Steve Jobs in the time period when he was asked to leave Apple and the time period when he returned. So that that in-between period was referred to as his wilderness period. And the term basically means a a period when you are going through a time of disorientation and uncertainty. And the idea behind that as a developmental opportunity is really interesting to me. When you create a wilderness experience, I believe that it opens you up to learning opportunities that would not otherwise be available to you uh, by putting yourself into that wilderness experience. And a lot of times those things happen to you when life just happens. But I also think that there's ways to create a wilderness experience intentionally. And that was really what the point of that, my last uh, podcast was about. Yes, yeah, so I think I'd used the word obstacle in the, in the sense of, there's a Ryan Holiday book, The Obstacle is the Way. And the, the point really is that they're not something to be avoided. In fact, they're to be embraced as growth opportunities. Um, as you're talking about opportunities, is this the same concept? Yeah, yeah, they they can be definitely obstacles. And the idea behind a crucible is it's something under tremendous heat and tremendous pressure. And on the other side of that, something really cool happens. So by putting yourself into this wilderness experience or this disorienting experience, you basically let go of all the preconceived notions that you might have otherwise, you know, about who you are and about how you should be and what's important. All of those things are stripped away. And in the absence of all of those things, new things emerge, new things happen, new insights occur. And it's, it's really remarkable. And the idea behind a wilderness experience as a learning experience is that when you don't have the routines, you're, you're open to new experiences, you're open to new ideas. And, and that's why I really advocate people creating them on their own, creating learning experiences or wilderness experiences on their own as an intentional way of putting themselves into profound learning. Yeah, in your, in your article or maybe in the video, you mentioned four specific factors. And one of those was immersion, which sounds mm-hmm. like some of what you're talking about, m- making sure that you have the bandwidth, Uh, you're immersed in something enough so that that you get those experiences. Yeah, immersion really is key because if you can get off the bus at any point in time, it really, it's kind of a mental out and you, you won't, you won't absorb the the full experience to the, to the extent that you might otherwise. 
um, you know, in in a case like, for example, when when somebody does a vision quest, like a five day vision quest or something, they're in the woods for five days, and they've committed to doing that. So of course they could always hike back out, <laughs> um, but you know it's hard. You know it's it's it, you know, it's really hard work to to get out of it. So being immersed in the experience is part of it because you you are left with nothing else but to embrace the unknown. Um, I think one of the examples that I've given in in the blog was the idea of starting a martial art where you're completely immersed in the martial art and I've I've been a martial artist for a long time uh, in a particular discipline of kung fu and then at one point I decided I wanted to try something new and I went to a jiu-jitsu school which is the complete opposite of the kung fu that I was studying and being immersed in that in that new environment was such a a real learning experience because there was nothing to do but 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 finish the class you know when you're when you're in there and you're engaged with somebody there's nothing you can do but be there in that moment and there's no way out of it and you're really just going to be open to the new to the new learning to the new experience it's really powerful yeah that's really cool i, I know th- there are some crucible events in fact one that that I'm personally signed up for later this year that uh, I think part of the way that they really uh, create that immersion effect or the, I mean, obviously you can always walk out the door, right? Or you can you can raise your hand and quit from something like that. Um, you, you're trying not to, but part of the way that they create, I think the, the stickiness or your commitment, your built-in commitment to stay is creating team type of atmosphere, whether it's a, a team event or a team competition. But it becomes about something about more than just yourself that if you've left, then you've let your team down. Uh, so I think, I think that's, that's one way that the, the thing I'm entering is, is creating another incentive to stay, stay immersed and see it through. Yeah. And I assume you've done something like this before. Uh, to an extent, this one is, is kind of a next level for, for me personally. Mm. I was curious if, if you have a sense of whether the fact that you're part of a team is the is the learning any different. Do you, do you feel like the learning is different than if – obviously, you were talking about the stickiness being different with a team environment, but I was curious if you, if you noticed anything different about the learning. Uh, you know what? We'll have to talk more about that when I, when I do this one. I, the events I've done in the past were uh, shorter in duration and larger in group than I think I personally would have liked and – uh, I think we're somewhat prohibitive to what I wanted to get out of it. So the event I've got coming up in July is a 12 hour plus and should be a relatively small group of people. So uh, there's an extension of, of time and, and effort and just suffering, honestly, that are going to go with that, um, that, that I think is designed to create some breakthroughs. Um, the smaller team aspect of it, I think is going to allow uh, a lot more openness and and I think a, a lot of emotion and self discovery uh, shared with each other is meant to come out of that small team environment. And then uh, this one's it's I mean it's a physical crucible. I think you talk a little bit about the the physicality being an important element. Um, this one seems to be a part of part of the uh, the mental challenge is the unknown, the uncertainty of what's going to take place. But from what we do know, some of it seems to be specifically designed to find everybody's discomfort or, you know, everybody has some area of weakness or fear. And I believe they've got something set up for, for everybody. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I can imagine the team element of it, based on my experience, that, that sword cuts both ways. On some level, having somebody else in the boat with you is comforting and and almost provides a slight way out of the wilderness experience but at the same time having a person and uh, having that interconnection and that interdependence really steps up the challenge because it's not just about you it's about you and the rest of your team and that creates another layer of complexity so i can really see something very powerful happening in that team aspect of it yeah i think that that makes some sense. So I, I think some of what we're facing in this in this July event, so I alluded to, they'll they'll I believe design something that that is going to scare or test everybody. Um, so 
if uh, and, and it's an overnight event, right? So if you've got somebody who, I don't know, has a fear of darkness, that's, that's going to be an aspect they have to deal with mentally. And there's probably no real risk associated with the darkness. It's at that point, it's, it's a self-created fear or it's a false fear, or, you know, we may do some small space stuff, crawl through a tunnel. And there's probably no real inherent danger to that, but somebody who has an issue with small space, that's going to be a real mental obstacle. Yeah. I, and you know, what's, what's really interesting, you know, as a, as a coach, I see people running into their limitations every day and no two people have the same limitations. So as, as an outside of observer, as an objective observer, I see people hitting their limitations and I, on some level, I have to fight the urge to say, well, don't you see that that's just fake? Don't you see that that's just your own barrier that you've created? But the reality is for that person, that barrier is as real as real can be. Um, you know, and, and so much of, of the things that get in our way in life are those self, you know, the self-created limitations, you know, the limiting beliefs. And, you know, it's pretty rare these days that you ever hit an actual, <laughs> you know, a real physical limitation. Uh, I, I heard on, on your earlier podcast, uh, you, you were talking with your guest about, you know, the idea that fear, you know, fear used to usually really represent a danger to your life. You know, there was some kind of a threat, a physical threat to your life. It's pretty rare in this modern day and age that we face those. But the other fears are just as real. You know, the ones that are self-created and, and the limiting beliefs, those are just as real for, for that individual. They're as real as, as anything else. Yeah, they become, um, I mean, they can become real you know, if, they're, if they're mentally real. They can become physically real. Right, as, oh, for as, sure. As a biology. So uh, easy example is somebody who's got anxiety around flying, right? You, you face getting on that airplane or you get on that airplane and whatever it is that's going on in your head, you know, suddenly that's, that's rapid breath. It's sweating. It's your heartbeat going crazy. You know, there's, there's suddenly a physical reaction in your body to that perceived issue. Totally. Yeah. And the physical body can also be an entryway into the change process. You mentioned earlier that the wilderness experience often includes a, a body element, and that's exactly the same phenomenon that you're describing, which is it's a bit of cause and a bit of effect. You know, the, the body, there are physical manifestations in the body when you have experiences, and creating or manipulating your physical body can can affect the the mental experience as well. Um, I'm sure you've heard of you know neuro linguistic programming, and a lot of the the premise behind NLP is a physical manipulation that causes uh, a, a change in the way a person behaves or or uh, perceives an event by physically manipulating the the physical piece first. So is, is that um, I mean simple example breath work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, breath work uh, in a meditative sense, I assume you mean, uh, is is uh, is a bit of physical and mental. I think you know, there's there's the physical slowing down. You know, if you're uh, if you're sitting on the cushion and you're watching your breath, for example, uh, then there you're leading with the physical, but there's a strong mental component there. Uh, a, a, perhaps a better example that people can experience almost immediately. Uh, I'm sure Mike, you've experienced the racing of your brain, you know, where your thoughts are running through your mind at a, at an unbelievable pace, right? You know, maybe you woke up at night and there was something going through your mind and the thoughts are just running through your head, like, like wild horses. One way to slow that down is to actually start speaking the words out loud. And it is remarkable how quickly that will slow your brain down because you're physically speaking and, you know, so I don't recommend you doing this while you're in bed, you know, next to, next to your wife, it might disturb her a bit, get out of bed and, <laughs> and, st and start walking. Um, and when you get to a place where you're not going to disturb anybody, just start saying the words that are going through your mind out loud and you will be shocked at how quickly your thoughts slow down because it's, you know, you're now engaging different parts of your of yourself, you know, you're engaging the physical part and you're moving your body, you're walking and you're speaking and all of a sudden your brain just slows way down. Um, that's probably a, a really simple example of how the body can affect the mind. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I have to give that a try. 
And I think you, you mentioned some others, you know, try doing some push-ups when, if you find yourself angry and it's very hard for your brain to coexist or take a different, different path at the same pace of something your body's doing physically. Yeah. My, the coach that I work with right now has assigned me a very, for me, what is a very challenging practice of, of introspection where I'm really trying to notice the difference between my, it's a very subtle practice. I'm noticing the difference between my thoughts my physical sensations and my emotions. And I'm really bouncing between those three. And it's a very exhausting process mentally. And I was describing some of the challenges that I'm having with this practice to my coach. And he recommended that before I do the meditation, I actually do some intense physical work. So I'll, I'll maybe pump out 10 burpees or something like that. And then I'll sit down on the cushion and engage in this very subtle practice. And it has really, it's really been effective in terms of getting me to be able to do that practice even when I'm exhausted. So, you know, I, I feel mentally exhausted. I don't want to do this difficult practice. I knock out 10 burpees and suddenly I can do it. That's a, that sound, it does sound tough and exhausting and complex. Although we we got to get you doing more ten burpees, more than ten burpees as a uh, as a hurdle. Well, it, it's it's really just a charge. It's it's more of a jump start. You know, I wouldn't. You know, it's not so much that the ten burpees are. Uh, you know, that wouldn't suffice for a for a you know a workout of the of the day. But as a as a way to get myself out of the cushion, it's a pretty it's a pretty cool charging effort where you know it's really just about getting my body engaged. Then all of a sudden I can sit down in what otherwise would be a very physically relaxing position if that makes sense yeah yeah sure does hey let's flip back to something else that features prominently on your website and that seems to be very fundamental and formative to you as a as an individual and as a coach can you tell me more about your vision quest yeah sure so my vision quest was something that i did in 2014 and uh let me back up just a little bit. A vision quest is a really a time-honored tradition across, I would say, pretty much every spiritual discipline has some form of a vision quest, whether you're talking about the Buddha or Moses or Christ or Muhammad. Really, every, every tradition has a vision quest. The vision quest that I did was really modeled after the American Native American tradition, where the vision quest was a rite of passage for usually for, for young boys, 14-year-old boys in the village who were going through the threshold to, to become men of the, of the tribe. And a vision quest in that experience involves really three crucial elements. So nature, deep, deep exposure to nature, fasting, and solitude. Those are the real three elements that make up the Native American vision quest. So in my experience, it was a five-day fast in remote wilderness in the Gila National Forest uh, in a situation where I had, you know, I had nobody, I didn't see anybody for, for five days. Um, and as we talked about earlier, the, the idea behind the, the vision quest, if you, if you look at it, what it's doing is it's stripping away all of the things that provide structure to your life on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you look around at your life every day, you're surrounded by people, you're surrounded by distractions, you're surrounded by routines like meals. And when you strip all of those things away, amazing things can happen. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I could see where that would be super powerful. How is that, uh, how is that different or is that a form of rite of passage? Well, I'm a little bit out of my expertise, but my understanding in the Native American tradition is that the, the vision quest was something that the, 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 the children of the village would experience when they got to an age where they were ready to start to make that, uh, that move to adulthood. So the, the experience of the vision quest became a, a rite of passage, if you will. So once you kind of had your vision quest experience, the people in the village now knew that you had reached a certain threshold of experience. Um, 
and if if you I mean really any complex system has such rites of passage. You know, we talked about martial arts, the belt system. The belt system is a rite of passage, and it marks that a certain person has had certain experiences. And the vision quest was in the Native American tradition was such a, a gateway and oftentimes it was marked by a tribal name you know you i'm sure you've heard of the idea of of the the name you know the the classic sitting bull and and uh, you know every tribal name you've ever heard i think oftentimes those came out of a vision quest so once a person had their tribal name it was because they did the vision quest which allowed the, the rest of the village to know where that person kind of was in the in the grand scheme of, of life and of the of the system that they that they organize their lives around. These are these are big things. Whether whether it's a five day fast and death ritual, or it's a you know, twelve hour, twenty four hour crucible event, a, a twenty six mile ruck. Um, how do how do, where does somebody start? How do you dial this back to uh, finding a place that's that's suited to you as an individual to start? And it may not be a physical event. Um, and it may be a much smaller type of thing. Um, I know you you have something that you call a, a jump start kit, and I think it's related around intentional living and life design, the theme of of uh, one of your coaching businesses. Um, so yeah, just back to the question: where where does one find a, a place to start, and then how how do these things start to benefit us in in life beyond? Um, overcoming particular challenges or hurdles. So in, in other words, find a place to start and then will it and how does it tend to benefit in all aspects of life, whether it's business or relationship or family, parenthood, things like that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really crucial that people start wherever they are. And, and that sounds like kind of a throwaway statement, but it's, it's really not. If you look at any significant endeavor done well, uh, it's always calibrated to where the person shows up. You know, it, 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 CrossFit is a, is a great example where CrossFit has these workouts of the day that, for most people, are so unachievable. It, it you know, it's 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 impossible. But there's still the system allows them to be calibrated to meet the the the, the athlete where they are. Um, and, and that's really important that people start where they are. So I think the first thing is to realize that wherever you are is your starting place. You know, wherever you are is your starting place. And there's, it couldn't be any other way. You can only start where you are. And, and with that, you have to find, you have to, you have to look for systems and teachers who are willing to calibrate and meet you where you are. And, to some extent, that actually happens naturally. I heard on, on a previous podcast of yours, Mike, that I listened to you. I think you had the phrase where you and your guests said, when, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Right, right. That is, it, it sounds mystical, but it's actually not. Um, because what happens is teachers are everywhere. If you look around, you, you, you can't go very far without seeing somebody who could be your teacher. But if that person isn't willing to calibrate they're never going to register as a potential teacher. Your brain is just going to dismiss them out of hand as, as not being a teacher for you. So, you know, being on the lookout for teachers who feel like they have a connection with you or feel like you can learn something from them, that's a really good place to start. You know, when you notice somebody who you have a connection with, it's probably because they're either at a level that's appropriate for you or they're calibrating to be at a level that's appropriate for you. So that is a really good indicator of a place to start. Um, you know, if you feel comfortable in the early stages of an experience, that is probably a good indicator that this is a good place to start. Um, oftentimes it does require an outside perspective. You know, you, you, can, um, you can do a lot on your own, but oftentimes you need somebody else to kind of look at things to say, hey, you know, Mike, you haven't thought about it in this way, or you're, you're being blinded by your own biases. And it does help to have an outsider to kind of say, have you thought about this? Um, and, you know, you're still going to, you're still going to filter that through your own, that through your own lens, but it, it does help to, to sometimes seek an outside perspective. Um, you mentioned the, the jumpstart kit 
that that we offer at the Life Design Center website. The Jumpstart Kit is nothing magical. It is it is merely a way to look at your life, and it forces you to look at your life, which is normally subjective. You know, your life is normally you know. Every day you live life between your ears. It's a subjective experience. The Life Design Jumpstart Kit forces you to take an objective look at your life. And in doing so, you might discover some, some edges that are interesting to you. And if you, if you do, you might start exploring those edges a little bit. You might start to learn more about what it means to, to grow in that particular area of your life. And then you know, you might start reading articles. You might start, you know, talking to people who seem to be more advanced than you are in that particular area. And it just becomes kind of a natural progression. That is usually how I recommend people start on any developmental uh, endeavor is, is go where it feels natural. You know, check in with yourself and ask yourself, where does it feel like I have room to grow? Where does it feel like maybe I have some some pain or some discomfort in my life, and it may be physical pain, but it, you know, I'm talking more metaphorical here. Where does it feel like I have room to improve, and and just gently kind of feel in that direction? Um, that is usually the best place to start. Uh, I think there's a trap that we that we fall into, um, which is you always want to get your instruction from an expert, right? I think that goes without saying. When, whenever you're seeking you're seeking advice or seeking a mentor or seeking uh, a teacher, you always want that person to be an expert, right? I mean, that just makes sense. The problem is that those experts have traveled the path a long way before you saw them. And it's, it's really crucial that you are able to kind of hold that in, in perspective. You know, you might be at the very beginning of a, of a path that an expert has traveled for their entire lives. And now a skillful expert will be able to recognize that and meet you where they are. Um, so, you know, the, the key there is to just be, to be comfortable, if that, if that makes sense. You know, if somebody feels like they're too advanced, then they're probably too advanced for you to, to be a follower of them at this point in time. Find, find something that feels a little bit more in your comfort zone and yet still a little bit stretchy. Yeah, I think just on that journey, um, you mentioned a belt system and, and martial arts. Uh, I've seen a uh, a saying hanging around some martial arts gyms. It's it's something along the lines of a, a black belt is nothing more than a white belt who never quit. Yeah, yeah, uh, that that ring is true with me. Um, at the same time, I've I've rolled with some black belts, and <laughs> there's there's definitely something magical happening there um but yeah no a lot of it you know you, you know your your podcast uh the word mastery is a very powerful word and and mastery implies a long process of 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 work you know of, of putting in the effort of putting the putting in the repetitions of putting in the minutes um, embracing the full cycle of learning the plateaus and the peaks and the valleys that happen um yeah, a black belt is somebody who's done all of that for a long time. Right. Yeah, embracing the the plateaus, embracing the embracing the suck, um, and you know, and, and for for me and my journey, and 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 we're talking about a journey of some duration um, in, in any of these examples. Uh, I, and that's why I asked about the start. Is that you you have another concept of four S's, but something has to bring somebody to a starting place or a desire to start some catalyst, um, from within or from without that I, I, have used this other phrase and I don't know if I got it from, from you or elsewhere of, of people living on autopilot or, or by default, um, versus, okay, a, a point in time, an internal or external catalyst or something else has caused somebody to say, I want to do something different. I want to, I want to design something different or I want to take conscious action on something. Um, so that that's where I'm coming from in, in asking a, about where to start. I guess that, that's a comment a little bit more on, on what, um, what creates a start in the first place. Sure. Yeah, what I always say is people who are experiencing one of the three phenomenon, either being lost, 
being stuck or longing for something else. That's usually how I like to describe where people might be in need of a start. Uh, if they're lost, if they're stuck, or if they're longing for something different in their life. And, you know, there, cause there are times when, when I'm none of those things, you know, there are times when my life just seems to be going really, really well. And I'm neither, I'm, I'm not lost. I'm not stuck and I'm not longing for anything. I've got, you know, it, it, everything just feels groovy. Um, it's when I am lost, stuck or longing that, that I know that I need to do something. So, you know, one thing to do is just be on the lookout in your own life and ask yourself, am I lost? Am I stuck? Or am I longing? And if the answer is yes, then you've got some work to do. You know, you've got to figure out, okay, what do I, what do I do next? If I, if I am lost, stuck or longing, does that, does that help as far as being a potential way to kind of notice a a need for a start? Yeah, absolutely. I think for for myself, maybe I just ha- I have more work to do. Is there's always something that's lost, stuck, or or longing. So things could be rocking along great, um, but if I really stop, think, and maybe that's where something like the objectivity of your jumpstart kit comes in. If I really sit, take the time to analyze or sit, there's some area, some aspect, something where one of those three things is is true, or Maybe I can I can look at my my current sphere and and think yeah I, I don't have any of those three things but if I want to look at some expanded goal set or objective then yeah I've got some areas where I'm stuck to be able to get there. Yeah, so you are a generally um, you're you're very self you know introspective and wired for personal growth. <laughs> so, you know, you said, you know, I'm always in a mode of, of something, you know, you know, on the, on the horizon for improvement. Not everybody is, is like that. Um, you know, a lot of people really don't spend the time to, to be on a de- developmental path the way that you, that you are or the way that I am, or probably that a lot of your listeners are. Um, so the notion, you know, sometimes people say to me, Mike, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I help people who are lost, stuck, or longing. And if they don't say, well, I, I'm one of those things, then they're not. You know, they're not, they're not ready for any kind of development. Now, the day that they get lost, stuck, or longing, hopefully they remember those words, and hopefully they notice when it happens. Because um, sometimes people really are just in a good place, and they really just are comfortable being where they are right now. Um, but if you are lost, stuck, or longing, there's another problem that can happen, which is what you alluded to earlier, which is I'm lost, stuck, or longing, but I'm not doing anything about it. And that is where, you know, the pain really starts to set in. That is where at the Life Design Center we call that living by default, which is I'm lost, stuck, or longing, but I'm not really doing anything about it. I'm just kind of enduring. I'm just kind of accepting as the the reality this lost stuck or longing and that that is where it becomes really you know painful and and really that's that's our mission is to help people get out of that mode yeah that, okay that makes a lot of sense I, I i like how you introduce yourself i don't know if your business card says i help people who are lost stuck or longing but but uh, i love that tagline that's awesome yeah i mean because you know right away if you if you are right and some people are not. Some people are like, "Wow, I'm, I'm none of those things." Well, great. You know, let's let's talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or or call me call me if you are. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And the, exactly. And the key is noticing it. Like, because some people are lost, stuck, or longing, but they don't even notice it. That's the that's where it becomes really tricky. Is because you can be lost, stuck, or longing and not know it. Because most people don't take the time to look at their lives in that in that objective way most people are just busy living right you know most people are just busy paying the bills uh, you know dealing with the the difficult relationships dealing with the crappy boss most people don't really take a step back and look at their life in any objective way and instead they just they just do what people do which is they deal with challenges as they arise and the idea behind the Life Design Jumpstart Kit is take a step back. Take a step back and actually look at your life objectively and ask yourself how things are going. You might find that they're going great. You might find that there's some things that you would prefer to change. And and then you can have the next the next step, which is do I want to make that change? 
but the first step is just simply noticing that things are a certain way. They, they always are. Things are always a certain way. And you don't have to just accept it. Yeah, no, that that makes total sense to me. So just <clears throat> sometimes it's just a matter of asking the question or, or think, you know, being asked the question and thinking about it for, for a, could even be a half a second. Yeah, and, and sometimes people, you know, if, if they have asked themselves that question already or if it's just kind of come up, you know, in some other way, people have, you know, these kind of moments where that something just clicks and they, they realize something. Um, other people just... You know, I think you're probably one of these people. You're always on a developmental path. So, you know, when something new starts to emerge for you, you're probably pretty attuned to it. You know, you're probably, you probably notice things quicker than, than your average person when something starts to kind of bubble up inside of you. And as a result, you're probably a lot better at kind of grabbing hold of it and pulling on that thread a little bit and seeing if there's really a there there. And, and even going so far as to like do something about it, um, whereas other people may not. They may not be as as kind of willing to even consider their lives in that way. Yeah, man, always a work in progress, no doubt about it. Yep. Okay, let me ask. You know, you know, we we start doing this type of work. We we get into a life design uh, center sort of coaching situation. Somebody might come at it with a particular issue that they've identified or you've helped them identify to work on. Uh, but at least in my own experience is you start to, you start to pull on that thread and you start to work on it and you might start to solve that or, or, or conquer that issue or move it forward. But then you start to realize benefits in, in all aspects. So maybe it's something yeah. around emotional self-control in, in an area you've identified and, and maybe that's a personal relationship thing, but then you start to see yeah. it, pay off and work. And I think you, you, you yep. touched on it early on, which is whatever's, whatever you think is going on is really not the root issue. Yeah. So there's, there's two things that come up for me w when you ask that question. The first is what I would call the interconnection of the different aspects of your life. At the Life Design Center, we tend to use a kind of a seven category model in, in the, in the Jumpstart Kit, we have you go through a self-assessment, which asks you questions about seven different aspects of your life. And I heard you on an earlier podcast, I think you described essentially the same model and, and you used six categories. The, the key there, and we're talking about things like your physical health, your work and finances, your relationships, your, um, your uh, spirituality. So these different kind of containers that, that make up your life. There's an interconnection between those containers that most people – neglect. And you think you have a problem in one area of your life. And in reality, that is either being affected or is affecting other aspects of your life. So, you know, your physicality affects everything about your life. Your, you know, your work and finances affect your relationships and, and vice versa. So noticing those interconnections is, is a really crucial piece of the, of the equation. And, uh, and it's what the, the life design jumpstart kit is really trying to get you to do is noticing the, the interconnection between what you think are disparate parts of your life. So when you make progress over here, you might actually make progress over there as well, um, because the pieces are interconnected. Um, the other thing that comes up for me when you, when you ask that question is what I would call ways of being. So whenever I'm, coaching somebody in a one-on-one -on -one situation, I'm always working with their way of being. So the client always has a topic that they think they're working on. Uh, they think they're working on uh, being a better manager at their job. And they're showing up to that job with a certain way of being. And they're, they're, they're doing certain things. They're believing certain things. That's their way of being. And what the client inevitably finds is that by changing their way of being at work, it almost certainly changes their way of being someplace else in their life as well, because you are who you are. So, and, and oddly enough, progress in one area usually results in progress in the other area as well. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of ties back to the notion of interconnection, but it really is, um, 
you know, the, the things that get you into trouble in one one part of your life are probably getting you into trouble elsewhere <laughs> in your life. <laughs> and no it's, doubt. It's, it, it's almost always the case. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, no doubt about it. I, I, I was thinking about this a little bit uh, myself recently, you know, whether, whether you compartmentalize or categorize seven things, six things, five things, three things, whatever it is, right. You're breaking down some areas of focus. Um, and it's not a stepwise function where I need to work on body and then I'll work on mind and then I'll work on spirit and then I'll work on wealth or, you know, something along those lines. Um, uh, it's, it's not only very parallel, but it's it's also very synergistic in, in my own experience. Totally, totally, yeah. I have a an interesting story about one of the clients who I was coaching in a one on one capacity, and he had a really good job at a really big technology company. And the topic that he came to me with initially was, "I want to be a better manager for my team." And during the course of the initial conversation with this with this guy. I was asking him a lot of questions, and I, at one point in time, I said to him, are, are you wanting to have your spiritual life anywhere in this coaching program? You know, because I'm, I'm willing to go there if you want to. This doesn't have to be a business-only conversation. And he said, no, no, no. That is, that's off, off limits for me. I keep those pieces of my life totally separate. And I said, okay. And I, I actually made a note that said something to the effect of, client says he doesn't want to have spirituality be part of his coaching topic it feels that feels incongruent to me and and nine months later his coaching topic had shifted from i want to be a better manager for my team to i want my spirituality to be the focus of my life (laughs) that's that's brilliant yeah and, and two years later he had left his job at that technology company and he had enrolled in in a uh, an Asian medicine school, and he now is a is a professional acupuncturist for his livelihood, and he feels much more aligned with his you know his his profession and his spirituality feel much more aligned to him. But you know, to him, those two things were totally unrelated. Oh, that's that's fantastic. You know what? You and I are going to have to. Uh, that's going to be a really good segue to another conversation sometime soon to talk about purpose um yeah yeah i love the results that uh that the guy in that story got i I think you you might have heard some of my recent talk with uh with andrew clark at boochcraft and uh he he gets into a discussion Mm -hmm. of that of what you know what passions drove him to make some changes to feel better aligned in his life and his uh his 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 i think continued quest for understanding his purpose yeah, purpose is a is a big topic for me. So for sure, we could we could we could go on for for days on that topic. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, perfect. Well, then let's um, let's set that one aside for for another chat in the future. Um, probably brings us to a pretty good place to wrap for today. I, I, again, I know you took probably more time than we planned, so really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate chatting with you, Mike. I, I really, I really do feel that what you're up to with the podcast is is really good stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to what this turns into. I think it's going to be really special. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, and I really appreciate you being an early part of the process. Uh, I mean, you you mentioned earlier the the importance of finding an expert. Um, and, you know, I, I say, and, I, and I've said it probably repeatedly, I don't think of myself as an expert. Uh, maybe someday I'll get there. But my quest here along with um, my own journey is to maybe bring some awareness for other folks. Um, Like you said, find somebody in the audience that that question clicks for the first time and they decide it's time to go seek out some information, maybe a coach. And so if something like Mike Herzog and life design center is, is right for them uh, I'm certainly going to put your, uh, your link here in the show notes uh, links to your website uh, you got a couple of them, and I believe just just uh, remind me again. You've got some material you put out on a pretty regular basis, right? Where, where else can we find you? Yeah, probably the easiest place for people to plug into, and, and thank you for for asking, is the Intentional Tuesdays. I think that's probably the easiest entry point for people if if they want to just go to uh, 
lifedesigncenter.com and they can get to the uh, link on there for blog, they can get uh, registered for Intentional Tuesdays and they can have uh, have it sent directly to their inbox each week where I explore a different topic each week, take on a different angle on personal development and really engage in some, some deep and hopefully provocative discussions. That's probably the easiest place for people to, to enter into uh, to my world. Okay, perfect. And again, I'll get a link out there for that. And um, yeah, with that, I'm going to say thanks, Mike. And, and again, appreciate your time today. Really, really valuable. I hope, uh, I know people are going to enjoy it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your time as well. Yeah, thanks, Take brother. Take care, Mike. Yep, you too. Okay, wow. Some amazing, powerful, and insightful stuff there from Mike Herzog of Life Design Center. Mike and I continue the conversation in part two of this episode coming up soon, where we really get deep on crucibles, systems, and structures for growth. For this episode, you can find the show notes and recap references and resources at manofmastery.com slash 003. Action items for this week. Follow up to this episode. I want you guys to think about where you've got boundaries, maybe false limitations, maybe areas for growth in your life, and start looking for a coach. Start thinking about a crucible event. Start looking for ways to grow. Two, head over to Instagram and follow us there. And three, flip back to iTunes or your podcast app and please rate the podcast. Okay, guys, thank you again. I am incredibly grateful for your time. The feedback so far has been amazing. Keep it coming and we'll see you next time.